to 2 Kings chapter 23, and we're going to begin reading at verse 31, so it's on page 396 in the Church Bibles, page 396. We continue to work through these final chapters of the book of Kings, and I'm going to read for us 2 Kings chapter 23, and from verse 31 through to the end of chapter 24. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for three months. His mother's name was Hamatal, daughter of Jeremiah. She was from Libna. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his predecessors had done. Pharaoh Necho put him in chains at Riblah in the land of Hamath, so that he might not reign in Jerusalem. And he imposed on Judah a levy of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, son of Josiah, king in place of his father Josiah, and changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. But he took Jehoahaz and carried him off to Egypt, and there he died. Jehoiakim paid Pharaoh Necho the silver and gold he demanded. In order to do so, he taxed the land and exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land according to their assessments. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 11 years. His mother's name was Zebaida, daughter of Padiah. She was from Rumah, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his predecessors had done. During Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. But then he turned against Nebuchadnezzar and rebelled. The Lord sent Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite raiders against him to destroy Judah in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by his servants, the prophets. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command, in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done including the shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord was not willing to forgive. As for the other events of Jehoiakim's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Jehoiakim rested with his ancestors, and Jehoiachin, his son, succeeded him as king. The king of Egypt did not march out from his own country again, because the king of Babylon had taken all his territory from the wadi of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem for three months. His mother's name was Nehushta, daughter of Elnathan. She was from Jerusalem. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father had done. At that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And Nebuchadnezzar himself came up to the city while his officers were besieging it. Jehoiachin, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, and his officials all surrendered to him. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehoiachin in prisoner. As the Lord had declared, Nebuchadnezzar removed the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the royal palace and cut up the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the temple of the Lord. He carried all Jerusalem into exile, all the officers and fighting men and all the skilled workers and artisans, a total of 10,000. Only the poorest people of the land were left. Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiachin captive to Babylon. He also took from Jerusalem to Babylon the king's mother, his wives, his officials, and the prominent people of the land. The king of Babylon also deported to Babylon the entire force of 7,000 fighting men, strong and fit for war, and a 1,000 skilled workers and artisans. He made Mataniah, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 11 years. His mother's name was Hamatal, daughter of Jeremiah. She was from Libna. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as Jehoiakim had done. It was because of the Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah, and in the end, he thrust them from his presence. Of course God will forgive me. That's his job. 
There's a, a quote from the German poet Heinrich Heine. In fact, apparently that's what he said on his deathbed. Of course God will forgive me. That's his job. And I wonder what you make of that. And I wonder how many people on their deathbeds comfort themselves with a similar sort of sentiment that God is good and benevolent and kind and forgiving and therefore in the end, when it comes to it, all will be well, regardless. That God will forgive them because that's what he does. There's a sense, of course, in which that would be a great thing for people to have picked up in life about God. For God is indeed benevolent and kind and forgiving. In fact, he's gone to extraordinary lengths to show us that, to make known to us just how committed he is to forgiveness. For the sake of forgiveness, God, in the person of Jesus Christ, gave himself up to to great suffering and unthinkable anguish, even to death so that people might be forgiven. And so for sure it's no bad thing if people come to hear and know about God as a God who forgives. But what if that's not the whole story? What if to know about God's forgiveness is one thing, is a wonderful thing, but to presume upon God's forgiveness... To assume that because he forgives, he will forgive us. What if that is a dreadful thing? If we're presuming on God's forgiveness, of course God will forgive me. That's his job. Well, then we will find 2 Kings chapter 24 and verses 3 and 4 a bit startling, I think. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood and the Lord was not willing to forgive. I wonder what you make of that. We're coming now to the very final chapters of the book of Kings and the final stages of the demise of God's people in the land. The northern kingdom has already gone and now we see that the southern kingdom, Judah, is not far behind them. And here in our passage this morning we see two key elements that are absolutely crucial in understanding why this is happening. One exhibited by the kings, where we see that this is a faithless slide into exile. And one exhibited by God, where we see that his is a fearful faithfulness. That's what we're going to examine this morning. Judah's faithless slide into exile and God's fearful faithfulness. These events happened over two and a half thousand years ago. But they have essential things to teach us today. So please keep your Bibles open as we turn to them together. And firstly, as we see Judah's faithless slide into exile. And I'm sure we've all had the experience of trying to make a change, trying to get into a better habit of some sort. And it lasting a little while before you slip back into the old patterns. I don't know what it might be, getting to the gym more regularly, not lying in bed and doom scrolling, getting all the homework done on the day that it's given. We set off with the, the best of intentions and for a few days we're totally on it, it's great. And then a few weeks later we look back and we realize, ah, we've just lapsed back into the old routines and habits. We've just had in Judah, in chapters 22 and 23, a great king. We've spent the last couple of weeks with King Josiah. 
under whom God's word is rediscovered, the covenant is renewed, the nation is reformed, the Passover is celebrated. And yet, as we saw last week, there is no real change. And we come to verse 32 of chapter 23, and we read of Josiah's son, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his predecessors had done. It's interesting, I think, that he does evil as his predecessors had done, not as his father had done, of course. But Josiah was the exception and not the rule. He was the standout and not the norm. Jehoahaz does evil in the eyes of the Lord. In his very brief three months, very messy reign, before he is carted off to Egypt. Jehoiakim, his son, he lasts 11 years, but, verse 37, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his predecessors had done. His son Jehoiachin, he lasts just three months again before Nebuchadnezzar takes him off to Babylon. But again, 24, verse 9, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father had done. And then Zedekiah, well, he lasts 11 years. And well, here we go. The record is stuck on loop, verse 19. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as Jehoiakim had done. These final four kings follow a predictable, repetitive, depressing pattern. The author of Kings, in fact, doesn't spend very much time at all going into the detail of their reigns, exactly what they, they do. Maybe by this stage they feel that as readers we've seen and heard enough of the activity of evil. But we can learn a little bit more about these guys from reading elsewhere in the Bible, in particular from the ministry of the prophet Jeremiah. His ministry covers the entirety of this period. He arrives sort of late on in the reign of Josiah and then ministers all the way through to the exiles, so the reigns of all these four kings. And in the book of Jeremiah, we get an insight into the hearts of these guys and therefore a little bit of the character of their rule. And I want us to just look at one example together. So I think the, verse, the relevant verse will come up on the screen, but if you want to turn to it, just pop something um, in 2 Kings 24, by way of a bookmark or stick your finger in it or something like that, and turn to Jeremiah chapter 36, which I hope might be useful, might be interesting for us to look at just for a couple of minutes. Jeremiah chapter 36 is on page uh, 799 in the Church Bibles. So this is Jeremiah during the days of King Jehoiakim, so the second of the four kings in our passage today. And let me read for us verses 1 to 6 of Jeremiah 36. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah till now. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, they will each turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. So Jeremiah called Barak, son of, uh, son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, Barak wrote them on the scroll. Then Jeremiah told Barak, I'm restricted. I'm not allowed to go to the Lord's temple. So you go to the house of the Lord on a day of fasting and read to the people from the scroll the words of the Lord that you wrote as I dictated. Read them to all the people of Judah who come in from their towns. Perhaps they will bring their petition before the Lord and will each turn from their wicked ways. For the anger and wrath pronounced against this people by the Lord are great. So Barak does what Jeremiah asks. He takes this scroll, he takes God's word that's been given to him through Jeremiah, and he reads it at the temple so the people can hear. And whilst he's there reading it, some of the king's servants hear him. And they say, gosh, this is, this is vital stuff, this is important stuff. The king needs to hear this. And so that is what ends up happening. So we flick forward 
Um, just across the page to verse 20. After they put the scroll in the room of Elishama, the secretary, they went to the king in the courtyard and reported everything to him. The king sent Jehudi to get the scroll. And Jehudi brought it from the room of Elishama, the secretary, and read it to the king and all the officials standing beside him. So here we have Jehoiakim, the king, with God's word being read to him. Verse 22. It was the ninth month. And the king was sitting in the winter apartment with a fire burning in the brazier in front of him. Whenever Jehudi had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with a scribe's knife and threw them into the brazier until the entire scroll was burned in the fire. The king and all his attendants who heard all these words showed no fear, nor did they tear their clothes. Even though Nathan, Deliah, and Gamaria urged the king not to burn the scroll, he would not listen to them. Instead, the king commanded Jeremiah, a son of the king, Sariah, son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, son of Abdeel, to arrest Barak the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet. But the Lord had hidden them. God speaks through his prophet to the king. The king has God's word before him. He hears God's voice. He hears God's message to him. Now remember, we've seen that recently in Kings. We saw it just a couple of weeks ago when the book of the law was discovered in the temple and King Josiah heard it. And what did he do? He humbled himself in his heart. He tore his robes. He said, this changes everything. But Jehoiakim, even as God's word is read to him, section by section, Steadily and deliberately, he cuts it up and throws it into the fire. He doesn't tremble before God's word. He treats it with absolute arrogant disdain. It's a message warning of coming judgment, and that is not the message that he wants to hear. And so, in fact, he receives a further message in verse 29 of Jeremiah 36, also tell Jehoiakim, king of Judah, this is the message from Jeremiah, this is what the Lord says, you burned the scroll that said, why did you write on it, the, and sorry, and said, why did you write on it that the king of Babylon would certainly come and destroy this land and wipe from it both man and beast? Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he will have no one to sit on the throne of David. His body will be thrown out and exposed to the heat by day and the frost by night. You see, we're not told all that much back in two kings about the exact nature of the evil that these four kings did. But we can assume it's pretty similar from what we've seen before in kings because it all flows from the same source. Exactly what we see here in Jeremiah 36, a flagrant disregard for God a willful ignorance of his world, and therefore embracing of false worship and a doing of great injustice. These four kings are faithless and foolish. They put their trust in their own wisdom and in the might of the nations. I think that's why we're told that the the king of Egypt no longer came out to fight against the king of Babylon because that was Judah's hope. That's what the king was relying on that the king of Egypt would come and help him out. That's where they chose to put their trust and not in the power and word of the living God. And so they led their people into disaster and ultimately to destruction. Across the decades, under Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin and Zedekiah, we witness Judah's slide into exile, but we need to see that they don't go kicking and screaming They stride towards it. They are the cause of their own demise. And it's important that we see that as in a moment we come to consider God's place in this sorry part of the tale of his people. The author of Kings wants his readers to see that exile comes about as a result of the people persistently, repeatedly refusing to go God's way even when they have all the evidence that God's way is best, and even when they have all the warnings 
but going their own way will end very, very badly. That's been the story, really, that's unfolded through the last 46 chapters. In our Bibles, 1 and 2 Kings are separate books, but that's just because they didn't have scrolls long enough in the ancient world. It was originally just one book, the Book of Kings, and it has, for most of it, been a story of a faithless people under faithless leaders, walking away from God, like a dog on a cliff edge, straining against the leash. So they have strained against God's mercy and pulled towards the precipice. These four kings serve as a reminder at the very last, exile happened because of the path that they chose to take. That is one element of what is happening here. Judah's faithless slide into exile. And secondly, the other element is God's fearful faithfulness. I mean, well done if you kept track during the reading this morning. It was not the easiest, was it really? I mean, Bible readings are all good for us. All scripture is given for our good, but they're not all as easy to follow as one another. Um, Sometimes I worry that that people think when the Bible is read, we're all just supposed to nod sagely and say, "Mm, yes. But you will not have been alone if you listened to the reading this morning and thought, what on earth? I can't follow all this business with Pharaoh and Egypt and Babylon and battles here and, and raiders there. It is quite a tangle, all the comings and goings here, really. There's a lot of geopolitical um, kind of machinations happening between Egypt and between Babylon with, with little old Judah stuck in between. In fact, we've got a map that just helps explain at this point in history, there are basically two major powers. You've got Egypt there in the kind of the orange... And you've got the Babylonian Empire spreading out from the kind of Euphrates, um, from Babylon there. And Judah, where Jerusalem um, is marked uh, on the map there, Jerusalem and Judah find themselves squeezed right in between. At this point, they're right on the kind of the, the, the rubbing point of the tectonic plates of these two great powers. Because we've got then a few other nations chipping in. We've got people with different similar names and then people having their names changed and then people's uncles being installed as puppet kings and so on. So if history is your bag and if military history and empires and all that, well, there's plenty of stuff here for you to get your teeth into. In fact, if you are interested in the history, this is one of those bits of the Bible where there's plenty of historical records outside of the Bible that refer to exactly this stuff, exactly the same um, events, exactly the same people, of course. Sometimes people talk about having the Bible and then having historical evidence. I think we need to be careful about describing it that way because the Bible is historical evidence. But it's always interesting when there are other sources to draw on as well. And like I say, if you'd be interested in looking further into this, then let me point you towards the Babylonian Chronicle. Um, The Babylonian Chronicle is a series of cuneiform tablets telling the story of Babylonian history, including this portion of it including the way it intercepts with Judah here. And fortunately for us, that is one of those bits of ancient history um, that during the Age of Empire we went and laid our hands on. And so we've got it stashed away, but we've got a number of bits of the Babylonian Chronicles stashed away in the British Museum. So you can pop down there and have a look. But for the rest of us, let me just try and summarise what is going on in, uh, in these verses. Judah is small and weak. Um, We get that from the numbers. When they cart off um, the fighting men, and there's a few thousand, compared to previous points in uh, in Israel's history, that is now a a kind of a rump of the army. They are small and weak. Egypt, to whom Judah was relying for help, well, Egypt is bigger, but getting weaker. And Babylon is bigger still and getting stronger. That is what 24 verse 7 sums up. The king of Egypt did not march out from his own country again because the king of Babylon had taken all his territory from the wadi of Egypt to the river Euphrates. So by the end of this section, Babylon is the boss. That's what's happening here. 
That's the headline. But history for history's sake isn't why we're being told this. The author's main observation, the lesson they want to be learned, is that all history, all the different nations and rulers, all the battles, all the rising and falling of empires, it is all playing out in God's hands, in God's timing, just as God had said. Have a look down at verse 2 of chapter 24. The Lord sent Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite raiders against him to destroy Judah in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by his servants, the prophets. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood and the Lord was not willing to forgive. We get the same point halfway through verse 12 of chapter 24. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehoiachin prisoner. As the Lord had declared, Nebuchadnezzar removed the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the royal palace and cut up the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the temple of the Lord. We get it again in verse 18. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem for 11 years. His mother's name was Hamatel, daughter of Jeremiah. She was from Libna. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as Jehoiakim had done. It was because of the Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah. And in the end, he thrust them from his presence. The weakening and exiling of his people is not a mark of God's weakness or his inability or his apathy, it is a mark of his sovereign control of all history. And it is a mark of his faithfulness to his word. That is what the author of Kings wants us to see. All this happened in accordance with exactly what God had said would happen. We'll see in our midweek studies, in fact, in Deuteronomy this year, that what happens here unfolds perfectly in line and according to God's word. He is absolutely faithful to it. And one of our friends recently was uh, talking about their son, and they referred to their son as having an injustice meter, um, which is to say he has a really acute sense of justice and fairness. And something had happened at school which they said well, it really set off his injustice meter because it wasn't right. Teacher had done something that was inconsistent, I think, or wasn't what they said they were going to do. And I can't recall if someone had been punished when they shouldn't have been or if someone hadn't been punished where they shouldn't have been, but it didn't matter. As far as this boy was concerned, it wasn't in line with how things had been laid out. But no one's injustice meter should be sounding an alarm at this point in the story of God's dealing with his people. I suspect that instinctively for lots of us it does. We feel uncomfortable, maybe we even bristle what, uh, what happens here. But this is no injustice. It is quite the opposite. It is a pure commitment to justice. God has been patient again and again. But in the end, God must act in accordance with his word, with his good word, because he is faithful. And fearfully so. Let me just take us again back to those verses in uh, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 24. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command, in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. And the Lord was not willing to forgive. God's faithfulness, God's holiness and justice and goodness requires, frightening though we might find the thought, those qualities in God require that he be unwilling to forgive. God is perfect in his nature. He does not change. He is perfectly consistent. And he doesn't have a job that he must perform 
for us or for his people. Even his unwillingness to forgive was something his people, his kings, had been warned about. If they'd have been reading his word as they had been commanded to, remember the kings were told to, to copy out the word of the law. Well, if they'd been doing that, then they would have read these words from Deuteronomy chapter 29. When such a person hears the words of this oath and they invoke a blessing on themselves, thinking, I will be safe, even though I persist in going my own way, they will bring disaster on the watered land as well as the city. The Lord will never be willing to forgive them. His wrath and zeal will burn against them. All the curses written in this book will fall on them and the Lord will blot out their names from under heaven. The Lord will never be willing to forgive them. God says that's what will happen, that's what must happen if you persist in going your own way. If you presume upon his forgiveness. God couldn't have been much clearer, I don't think. If you think I will be safe, if you presume upon God's forgiveness, God says you will not get it. That God warns, God warns and God gives opportunity. We must be clear that by this stage in the story of Judah, this unwillingness to forgive, by the time we reach this point, is not the same as saying God was never willing to forgive. Even in the case of these kings. Do you remember that? I don't know if you picked up on the verse in Jeremiah 36. Jeremiah 36 verse 3. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, they will each turn from their wicked ways. Then I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. God was willing. God extends the opportunity for forgiveness. But they were unwilling to turn and be forgiven. Jehoiakim presumed upon God's favour and forgiveness. He says to Jeremiah, don't tell me that. Don't, I don't want to hear a word about coming judgment. I don't want to hear a word that says that the king of Babylon is coming. Oh, he's not worried about that. I'm not worried about coming judgment as a result of sin. Don't tell me that. We'll be fine. I'll be fine. He refused God. And so God was not willing to forgive. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and in what I think is one of the most affecting passages in the Gospels, talks about the way that there will be those at the last who will cry out, Lord, Lord. And Jesus will say to them, I never knew you away from me. It is in Jesus' kindness a stark warning that if we refuse God's grace because we presume upon his forgiveness and therefore disregard him today and go our own way in life, we may reach the place where we have passed the point of no return. Where, like Judah, here at the end of chapter 24, we find ourselves thrust from his presence. God is a fearful faithfulness. Of course, God will forgive me. That's his job. If you're here this morning and that kind of idea, that kind of sentiment describes your attitude, then let me urge you to urgently reconsider whether you might be striding towards disaster. And let me point you towards the God who in his faithfulness is willing 
to forgive all those who come to him with a genuine, humble faith and say, I need you to forgive me. I want to listen. I want to turn. I want you to be the God of my life and the guide of my days. I want to go your way and not mine. Do as Moses calls the people to do in Deuteronomy. Do not presume and do not refuse, but choose life. Because the offer is open, it is free, it is complete. By the death of Christ there is grace and forgiveness enough for all who will accept it. Including you and I. Do it today. Don't sit on it. Don't think, well, interesting, maybe I'll give this some more thought at some point. I'm sure it'll be okay in the meantime. Don't presume. Let us learn the lesson of these foolish kings. Let us pay attention to Judah's sorry slide <laughs> into exile that we might not follow such woeful footsteps. Let us listen to God's voice, speaking to us a word of merciful warning before it is too late. I'm gonna give us just a minute of quiet to reflect, maybe to pray in the silence. And then we'll stand and sing our final hymn.